right, welcome everyone, and thank you for spending your morning or afternoon wherever you are uh, with us. We are extremely grateful for you taking the time with us today. Um, wild uh, attendance numbers um, for this webinar. Uh, last check, we were well over a thousand people uh, in 44 states. So again, really appreciate it. Uh, Scott and I try to do our best to provide informative and entertaining um, CPE to you all. Um, we are going to need to work on those other six states, though. We'll have to figure out who those six states are and at least find a friend in those six states so we can kind of cover cover the map with all, with all 50 states. So our topic uh, today is GASB's 100 and 101. Uh, and so we're going to be covering uh, this over the next hour. For those of you all who do not know me, uh, my name is Danny Martinez. I'm a managing director here. I lead our national government and public sector accounting advisory group, uh, previously served on the AICPA's technical issues committee as the uh, GASB zone chair. And what I do with our group now is you know, we lead our national group. And what we try to say is we help governments with accounting and finance tasks so they can move from always working on the urgent thing to being able to work on the more uh, important things. So again, thank you again for being here today, Scott. Uh, thanks, Danny. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, wish you had not set that high bar of being entertaining, um, but we will do our best with that. I've been with the firm for almost 19 years. Um, and during that time, I've served almost primarily as an auditor in North Carolina, in Florida, um, and in Virginia. Um, I spent two years having the time of my life up at the GASB as a practice fellow. And then since returning, I have taken on the role as lead of our um, government audit assurance practice, technical lead. Um, and then the other part of my day job is helping Danny with those advisory services, um, helping to write ACFRS, um, helping to implement guidance and standards. And thrilled to be here today and to talk about what's, what's happening this year. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we have a packed agenda today, as those of you all have attended our webinars uh, can attest. And so within this next 54 or so minutes, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to take a quick look at Gatsby's timeline, kind of lay the foundation for where we are in, in terms of the standards that are coming down the pipeline, what you can be looking forward to. And then we're going to break it up about half and half. Uh, so we're going to spend half of the time talking about GASB 100, and then we'll give some examples because what we found from our attendees is they like to see some specific examples of, okay, I understand the guidance, but can you show me how that would apply in certain scenarios? Then we're going to shift our focus to GASB 101 and talk about compensated absences and give some examples uh, there as well. You will want to stay uh, along for the whole time because at the end, we will talk about our GASB 101 uh, compensated absences bucket checklist that we developed that helps you to think through uh, categorizing uh, and determining the accounting for the type of co compensated absences that your government provides. We will field questions at the end, but we know that you all may have questions throughout. So as you heard prior to the webinar, just submit them in the chat and we will answer them as we can. Uh, sometimes we like to fit those in when we're doing the uh, polling questions. All right, so let's take a quick look at Gatsby's timeline before we move to 100 uh, and 101. So let's start out with our first polling questions to get a feel for uh, when these standards are, are applicable to you all. Uh, can you please just fill in your year end, either say June 30, September 30, December 31, or other? All right, so it looks like 69% of you are June 30s with 17% September 30th and 8% uh, December 31. Perfect. So in looking at the the timeline and, and where we are, you can see here the, the arrows that we have is the topics that we're covering today. A lot of you all are just going through or are finishing going through um, what you have there in the 2023 year end. Of, of particular note, you had GASB 94 and 96 were of the, the biggest lift kind of of that bunch. Um, so those of you all that are calendar year end 31s, you're probably still kind of working through uh, the implementation or going through the audit of GASB's 94 and 96. In there you, as well, you'll see GASB 99, which is Scott's favorite GASB. Uh, he will be gladly tell you for uh, an hour and a half over dinner and drinks um, 
how much she enjoyed uh, helping and assisting with GASB 99. And then you'll see where we are uh, today with GASB's 100 and 101. One thing that you will note for those uh, calendar year ends, uh, you do get to go first this time with uh, compensated absences uh, in GASB 101. And although the June 30 and September 30th, 30s have another year, so not till fiscal year 25 is uh, 101 effective, early implementation is encouraged for both 100 and 101. Uh, so we want to make sure that we point that out. As well, uh, GASB 102 has been released in the last uh, few weeks. And so that is also um, out there as well. And you can see the implementation date for that. In terms of other act GASB activities, the only thing I want to point out on this slide, I was listening to a webinar a few weeks ago uh, from Alan Skelton, the Director of Research and Technical Activities at GASB. He was doing a webinar with uh, AGA Atlanta chapter. And what he said is, we hear you. We understand that you've, you know, you've gone through a lot with COVID, with implementing 87, implementing 96. We understand that you might need a little bit of a break or that you might need uh, to not have the level of implementation uh, going forward. And so this is me communicating through Alan to you all um, that they hear you. And so you can see in terms of other GASB activities to this year related to the financial reporting model and classification of non-financial assets. One thing to point out is that the financial reporting model did have the change in the governmental funds pulled out, which was going to be the biggest undertaking. And so that was pulled out. So that'll make that uh, implementation a little bit more uh, manageable. And then you can see the, the other ones listed there, longer runways, December 2025 and into 2027. Scott, anything that you want to chime in uh, related yeah. to this? Yeah, two things I want to say. First, notice with the projects that are happening right now that there is no implementation guide update. Um, we used to see those every year. Um, and then they went a year, I think it was uh, 2021 without one, or maybe it was 2022. Um, no, no implementation guide update on the works for this year. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't do it next year as well. So those are more and more infrequent. Um, and that, that may be an underlying strategy um, of the GASB. The other thing I want to point out is with regard to this pre-agenda research. Now, I got a survey request from the GASB last week. I bet many of you also did. I would encourage you, if you haven't, to fill it out. It actually was a very short survey. It took me just a couple of minutes, but I believe it's related to this gap structure pre-agenda research. Those are very important. I can tell you from firsthand knowledge that that, that feedback is used to direct the, the, the direction of these, this future project. So, so please provide that feedback to the GASB on how you use the, the gap literature that's out there. Perfect. Thank you, sir. So let, let's go ahead and move on to our uh, second polling question. How do you at your government stay on top of and implement new GASB standards when they come around? Do you figure it out when dealing with the audit? Do you assign a team member responsible for tracking new standards and leading the implementation? Do you partner with professional service firms such as uh, our uh, government and public sector accounting advisory group to assist in implementation? Or do you do you figure it out on your own, but you would be interested in having help, like you just haven't quite pulled the trigger on looking for a co-sourcing or outsourcing model? Or lastly, I am Gatsby. Uh, we we say that jokingly because we do know we have a few Gatsby friends on here who use us as one of the resources for uh, free CPE. So kind of like I am Batman, uh, I am Gatsby. Go ahead and answer that if, if you're Gatsby. I would have said I am Iron Man. Isn't that the more... Recent uh, I am Batman. I am Iron Man. I've been I've been known to have really terrible analogies on these webinars. I'm a Marvel guy. You must be a uh, Batman guy, whatever that is. <laughs> all right. So it looks like half of you all assign a team member responsible. That is great. Uh, Twenty percent of you all partner with a firm like us to implement. I say, you know, especially now in these days where it's very difficult to get that government accounting expertise. You know, great. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, we're seeing a lot more. City managers, county commissioners being open to, to that type of approach. 24 of you saying, I am Gatsby. Um, I know that there's not 24 people from Gatsby on here. So the, the rest of you, I really appreciate your confidence in saying that, you know, you're basically Gatsby because of how good you are at this stuff. All right, with that, let's, let's turn it over to our first big topic. Uh, Mr. Scott, I'll let you go ahead and start with statement 100. Great, thank you, Danny. 
Uh, you know, anytime I mention to somebody that I spent some time at the Gatsby, almost always the first thing that they say to me is, when is the Gatsby going to give us a break? Um, I hear it a lot. Um, not that I had control over the pace of play while I was at the Gatsby, let alone now that I'm not there. But I will tell you, for you June 30 year ends and 930 year ends, this is this is your break. Consider this to be your break. Not that Gatsby 100 is not an important guidance. I think it is very important, but it is one of those standards where you can implement it and have really no impact on your financial statements in the year of implementation. So this was one where I had been encouraging um, many to go ahead and implement this early, um, especially last year when I saw a, uh, I, I had a few clients who had some correction of an error or or had some changes in accounting principle. And um, and I recommended go ahead and issue or go ahead and implement Gatsby 100 because it provides you actually more guidance than what's in 62. And that might help you um, with your, your, uh, your, your change. Um, go to the next slide, Danny. So Gatsby topic or Gatsby 100 um, does amend uh, 62. Uh, it supersedes the section in 62 called prior period adjustments. Um, there are two uh, primary things that's covered, accounting changes and error corrections. Um, the first thing you will note is that the term prior period adjustment is no longer in the guidance. Um, the term never did feel right anyway. It, it it didn't seem right to cover an area where not every situation resulted in a prior period adjustment. And so we just call it um, error corrections and accounting changes. Um, go ahead, next slide, Danny. We'll start with accounting changes. Um, Within the guidance, there are three types of accounting changes, um, change in accounting principle, change in accounting estimate, and change to or within the financial reporting entity. And this is one of those changes, um, as I had said, or maybe I didn't say, but a lot of the guidance is very similar with, with, with what's in GASB 62. Um, this is more of a refresh, a clarification, and then it does add new guidance where there was no guidance before. And one of those is this change to or within a financial reporting entity. It covered changes with or changes to financial reporting entity in GASB 62, but did not address changes within a financial reporting entity. So let's look at the first one, change in accounting principle. Um, there are two types of changes of accounting principle. The first is a change from one generally accepted accounting principle to another. Um, and that, that that can be anything. There, there are options within GAAP of, of how you can account for something. Think of the different options for depreciation. Um, think of uh, fair value measurements. Um, there are some options that you have to choose from. And then the change in accounting principle is changing from one that's generally accepted to another that's generally accepted. It uh, does not apply when you go from a non-GAAP um, treatment to a GAAP treatment. That would be a, a, a correction of an error. It uh, doesn't apply when you're an entity that doesn't follow Ga Gatsby's framework and you're implementing it for the first time. But it strictly is about when you change from one accounting principle to another based on um, a justification that you're improving on the qualitative characteristics of financial reporting. And I'm sure we all know uh, what those are, relevance, reliability, comparability, consistency, timeliness, and um, understandability. So as long as the change is going to improve the financial reporting based on those characteristics, then that's that's what this is talking about. Um, the second is the implementation of a new accounting pronouncement, um, which, which happens all the time, perhaps is the most um, uh, common change in accounting principle. Um, prior to GASB 100, there were um, Every standard has had a transition provision a paragraph or two at the very end to talk about how the guidance should be applied retroactively, prospectively, um, all of that. And what this is doing in GASB 100 is you no longer will have that transition guidance unless the board, unless GASB is going to stray from this guidance. So perfect illustration of this is when GASB 100 was issued in June, GASB 101 was issued the exact same time. And, uh, and and probably on purpose, but this was a perfect illustration. The compensated absences became, became 101 because then it did not have to include its own transition guidance. Rather, you'll notice it references to GASB 100 for how to implement the guidance. And then you'll see with GASB 102 that that paragraph's not in there at all. So anytime you're implementing a new accounting pronouncement, you're going to follow the guidance in 100 unless the guide, unless the new standard says otherwise. 
A change in accounting principle um, requires a retroactive implementation, um, which means you're going to start from the beginning. Uh, you're going to implement it in the beginning of uh, the, mo the beginning period, the earliest period presented in the financial statements. Um, we noticed that when many governments were implementing GASB 87 and 96 that required this retroactive, that they switched to a single year presentation, which makes this this easy. And 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 so then you're just restating your beginning uh, fund balance or net position. One thing that doesn't seem to be covered in GASB 62 is what to do with required supplementary information and supplementary information. Um, GASB 100 addresses it directly. Um, you, we're talking about here the MDNA where you've got comparative information, um, also the statistical sections where there's also a 10-year trend information. Um, for purposes of, of, of the GASB, statistical section is supplementary information. Um, we think of it a little bit different on the on the audit side. But what this is saying is that you should not restate anything beyond what's presented in the basic financial statement. So that's not an option. That's not you can do it if you want to. That's you you should not. And if by not restating prior periods, it's going to uh, make the information not consistent, not comparable, then you would add an asterisk and explain that that's why it's not comparable. So I think that helps. Um, I've, I, th I think it was hard when... Um, some governments are trying to figure out what to do with the MDNA when they're implementing new guidance. And, and a lot of them were doing this already, adding an asterisk and explaining that it's not restated for the new pronouncement. Um, but now it, that's, that's the rule that you can't restate it. Uh, the next is change in accounting estimate. Um, I want to first point out a nuance with change in accounting estimate. Uh, there is a definition of what an accounting estimate is in here. And um, the, de the definition is an estimate is uh, outputs determined based on inputs, assumptions, and measurement methodology. Uh, but then it also provides a definition of change in accounting estimate. And a change in accounting estimate is only a change in the inputs. So if your estimate is changing because the methodology is changing, that's actually more like a change in accounting principles. So what we're talking about with a change in accounting estimate is a change in the input itself. Um, that change needs to be the result of a change in circumstance, uh, new information, or more experience. So if the input is being changed because of information that you probably should have had to begin with, that's that's more of a correction of an error. This is talking about changing with based on new information and new experience. Um, a change in estimate is different from a change in accounting principle in that it's going to be reported prospectively. So you're going to make that change in the year that the changes occurs. And, and moving forward, you don't go back and restate or restate your beginning uh, net position or fund balance. And of course, since it's a perspective, no need to worry about what to do with RSI or SI. Uh, back one, Danny. There you go. Change to or within financial reporting entity. Um, I think this is an important one. Um, there, there wasn't guidance previously about the addition or removal of a fund um, or change in fund presentation. And that that does happen, um, especially if funds move from, from major to non-major. Um, it also includes guidance on the addition or removal of a component unit or change in a component unit presentation. Um, a note, however, if, if the transaction or the movement falls within the scope of GASB 69, um, meaning if it meets the definition of a government combination or disposal of operations, or if it's um, of government's reporting majority uh, equity interests in a legally separate organization, those will stay in those standards. This isn't going to affect that, um, but any other change outside of this. Now, this is the one area where uh, there actually is a, an implementation guide from the last implementation guide uh, Q&A. There's one question with regard to the movement of a fund um, due to a continuing operation or or based on whether or not there's a continuing operation or not. So uh, there is a Q&A to be aware of uh, with regard to, to this. Um, anytime you have a change to or within a financial reporting entity, you're going to uh, account for by reporting, uh, by adjusting the current uh, reporting period's beginning balance as if the change occurred at the beginning. Uh, you might note that if you are single year presentation, it may be the exact same as retroactive. You're, you're restating your beginning balance as if this has always been, been the case. Um, and then the same with required supplementary information and supplementary information. You're only going to restate what's presented in the basic financial statements and, and go no further. 
any of these changes, accounting changes, um, require a disclosure in the financial statements. Um, I would say the, the the main why for this standard is in the pre-agenda research, they found that governments just weren't presenting or disclosing or reporting these changes very consistently. And so I think there's a lot um, of emphasis to be placed on what the new requirements are for disclosing and present, presenting. Uh, you are required to disclose the nature of the change, the reason for the change. Um, and if the prior periods are not restated, what's the reason? Um, and, and which is only allowable if it's not uh, practicable. Uh, the next part is um, change, or, or I'm sorry, an accounting uh, error, error correction, um, which the definition of that has not changed much. If you want to go to the next slide, Danny. Um, resulting from a mathematical mistake, mistake in the application of accounting principle or oversight or misuse of facts. Um, so anything, any fact that existed at the time that the statements were issued that reasonably be expected to know um, or taken into consideration, that would be an error correction. Basically, this is Monday morning quarterback. What it should have, should have known about it, didn't know about it. Uh, it's an error correction. So it's it's a fine line, uh, perhaps requires some, some judgment. Um, go ahead and move on to the next slide, Danny. Error corrections are just a little bit different and a little bit the same. Uh, the same in that you are going to account for retroactively by restating the beginning net position fund balance um, or uh, for the cumulative effect. Um, different in that there is a different requirement for RSI and SI. Um, if there is an error, you are going to go back as far as you need to to fix the error. The idea being um, you really shouldn't have any information in your financial statements that you know is wrong. So you're going to go back and fix that if even if it goes back a few years um, and is outside what is reported in your in your basic financial statements. Um, one other thing, um, and I think this is important and goes along with what I said about reporting these consistently, um, this guidance does require that the face of the financial statements um, aggregate the adjustment being made. So in my mind, you've got your, your beginning uh, net position as previously stated, then you're going to have the aggregate amount of the adjustment, and then you would have the new beginning balance and then your changes in the current period and your ending balance. So that should be on the face of the financial statements. Um, aggregate would imply there's more than one. There may not be more than one. And so it could be pretty clear what that is just from the face. But if it's an aggregate amount, there's several different adjustments. The notes would also include more detail about that. And by the way, that's not an if. The notes should include this information in a tabular format by reporting unit. Um, in my firm, in, at Cherry Becker, um, in my experience, we've always done it this way. We've always had kind of that tabular format in, in the notes, and we've always presented it on, on the face of the statements, but it's not always the case um, uh, with, with a lot of governments. And this, this makes it a little bit more transparent, makes it very easy for the user of the financial statement to know what's happened and why. All right. Thank you, sir. So we're going to spend a couple minutes now practicing. So, so let's go through three different scenarios and let's let's see if we can figure out which change uh, it is. And so let's let's work through these. The first first one is with a university, the University of Oopsville. So I attended the University of Southern California, um, and we have a a different name for this college. We we call it uh, UCLA, um, but here we'll call it University of, of Oopsville. So the University of Oopsville added a foundation as a component unit to the reporting entity in fiscal year uh, 2024. Thank you for the uh, the little crying faces. I will keep my day job as an, as an accountant. Um, so this one, for all these scenarios, you're gonna have a little bit of, a, of an opportunity to say, well, yeah, but if this, but if that, you know, depending on certain facts and circumstances, maybe you can get to a different answer. So we're asking to kind of go with us here in terms of, um, you know, the, the limited um, amount of information that you have. So a new component unit that is bring, brought into the reporting entity. Um, assuming that this wasn't something that was an error, um, what would this be? So would it be an accounting change or an error correction? If they weren't correcting anything, but they were just bringing it on. So that would be an accounting change. And then we have three options that we can choose from. We have estimate, um, accounting principle or a change to or within a financial reporting entity. 
And so this one would be a change to or within a financial reporting entity, right? Because we're bringing this on. So what needs to be done to present this appropriately in this year's financial statement? So you would be able to go back uh, to slide 16 um, to see in more detail, but it, we want to report by adjusting the current period's uh, beginning balance to act as if this change began at the beginning of the reporting period. Uh, for the RSI and SI, you don't need a restate, but you will want to have that little asterisk and reference the note to point out um, why the information uh, is not comparable. Um, you'll also want to point out in the notes to the financial statement, the nature of the change, identification of the items affected, and the reason that that change was made. One thing I want to point out here that Gatsby did a great job with in Gatsby 100 is there's illustrations of, of what it needs to look like, like Scott said, in that tabular format. And they even give a narrative, a little word disclosure paragraph of how you should explain this. And two of the examples that they give are related to change to or within a financial reporting entity. One of them with bringing a component unit on, one of them with taking a component unit off. So that you can go straight to the, the, the guidance itself to be able to get some illustrations there. All right, next one, the state of Miss Hapipi. Uh, as part of their evaluation of new accounting pronouncements, the, the, it should say the state, the state identified that they have three P3s that are subject to GASB 94. They're going to implement the standard during the year it is effective. So they didn't miss it, and now they're trying to implement it um, in a subsequent year, but they're actually implementing GASB 94 in the appropriate year. So this is just what you all have just went through with 87 and, and 96, right? So is this an accounting change or an error correction? So in this case, it's an accounting change. And now we'd figure out, okay, which one? And this one would be a change in accounting principle. Uh, so what needs to be done in, in terms of this one? Uh, same idea, if you're gonna re report the change retroactively to the beginning of the earliest period presented. Uh, for those of you all that had comparative statements, you know, you remember that you gotta go back to that earliest period presented on your basic uh, financial statements. Uh, you won't restate RSI, but you will have that note disclosure in there, just like we pointed out in the previous example. Uh, in the notes, you'll want to talk about the nature of the change, the lines impacted, and what pronouncement you, um, uh, you implemented. You don't really need to explain the reason why, because stating that you implemented, in this case, GASB 94, is uh, the reason why. All right, last one, the city of Bungle, Texas. So Bungle evaluated the depreciable lives of their capital assets and determined that based off of new information, let's assume it's a like a new uh, useful life study that, that, that they did, that it'd be more appropriate to have a useful life of 30 years for a certain type of their capital assets uh, than the 50 years that they were using. Is this an accounting change or an error correction? And so going to Scott's point and how you got to go along with us with facts and circumstances here is this is based off of new inputs. So there was a new input that came in that made um, this preferable to, to change the useful life. And so that we would treat that as an accounting change. So then which accounting change would it fall into? And so that would fall into change in accounting estimate. And so for this one, you are going to apply it prospectively. So recognizing in the current period, so just following that through the current period, note the nature of the change and why it is preferable. All right. Hopefully that was hopefully that was helpful. Whenever we do these in in live, we allow for more group discussions, more conversation back and forth. But we do want to make sure you all get a feel for both 100 and 101 uh, within this allotted hour. So with that, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Scott to now touch on the second phase, which is uh, statement 101: compensated absences. Perfect. Thank you, Danny. Uh, great examples. Uh, I always pulled for USLA in that rivalry, but I guess, what do I know? Um, all right, so next polling question, I guess we'll just jump to the polling question before we get going with compensated absences. How much time have you spent analyzing how GASB 101 will impact your government? Um, it's been out since uh, 2022, June of 2022. Uh, not effective for June 30. Um, year ends or 930 year ends this year, but affected for 1231s. Uh, so you do have some time uh, to think about it. Uh, I happen to know some governments who actually early implemented this guidance. So I'm, I'm curious to know how much time have y'all spent analyzing how this will impact your government? 
All right. See, we are entertaining and funny. We mm -hmm. just made 43% laugh when we asked that question. 38% um, has spent an hour or two. I assume that might be a, a webinar or two, um, three to eight hours for 13% of you. And then some of you have spent a lot of time on this, eight plus hours. Um, so great. I'm glad we can help up those hours for you today. Um, those, those of you with the uh, the eight plus hours, if you, if you weren't aware, we also do a podcast series where we talk through. Uh, we have one out on 100 and one out on, on 101. We would love to get some of you all on that, that have actually spent a lot of time digging through this and kind of learn what you found. Um, so I may, may reach out to you all after and, and see if any of you all would be interested because I think that's great. All right, so let's talk then about compensated absences. This is this is a refresh. This is uh, an amendment from uh, of GASB 16. Well, amendment maybe it's it's, it's a superseding GASB 16. Um, I guess the first thing to talk about is what exactly is a compensated absence. Compensated absence is not a new term. Uh, it is an accounting term, but it's not new. Um, I don't even think GASB 16 invented the term, but GASB 16 did provide a very simple definition of compensated abs absence. According to GASB 16, it is an absence for which an employee will be paid, such as sick, vacation, or sabbatical leave. Um, GASB 100 also provides a definition um, which is simultaneously more specific and less specific. More specific as to the manner in which employees are paid, uh, but less specific in that it doesn't identify the specific types of leave. Uh, so the GASB 101 uh, definition acknowledges that there, in many cases, uh, employees aren't simply paid when they are absent, but um, sometimes are paid for not using the absence. Sometimes the payment is a non-cash settlement to a, a post-employment plan. And I think it's obvious that that definition, um, that, that through the statement, the GASB is trying to address an employment environment that is more complex than what existed in the early 90s. Um, the The... Guidance does provide some examples of, of what a compensated absence is. This is, a, a, examples include, which means it's not all inclusive. There are plenty of other examples. Um, rarely does the GASB provide examples that are all inclusive that would indicate a future amendment to guidance if they did that. And so they'd stay away from that generally. But this is an example of what types of leave this would be addressing. Uh, we did our own little, uh, uh, I, th I think Danny will will allude to our bucket uh, checklist. We came up with over 25 different types of leave. Um, so there is a lot of types of leave out there. Uh, we ran it by our HR department who gave us a couple more. So I think we ended up with a list of 29 different types of leave. So there is a lot of leave out there um, for governments to to consider as as to its relevance to to this new guidance. Um, two things to think about. Uh, this guidance does not address certain types of sabbatical leave. So when I was um, up north, um, I had a, a neighbor who was a tenured law professor at, at a big university, and he he taught um, a lot, and he also did research, but he referred to it as sabbatical when he wasn't teaching. So he was not teaching for a semester. He had more freedom to, to do things, um, but he had a published paper, so he was still actively working on stuff for the university. And so that's the type of sabbatical that's not addressed here because that's not considered to be leave per se. Um, it also doesn't include anything within the, the scope of statement 47. Um, if you remember statement 47, it addresses early retirement incentives and severance packages. I'm not sure how many governments are offering early retirement incentives right now, but that's, that's what that guidance covered. And it makes it clear that that kind of benefit is a different nature from salaries and benefits that an employer provides as compensation for employee services. But I wonder if perhaps this doesn't shape or or, or change how you might think about some of these early retirement um, incentives. Um, when you have non-vested sick leave, perhaps you might think of that to be not related to to uh, employee services and may have thought that to be part of these retirement benefits. But GASB 101 makes it clear that the board thinks of that as leave associated with service provided by employees. <clears throat> so this guidance in 101 um, gives principles. GASB 16 was very rules-based, three types of leave. Here's your 
your requirements for each type of leave um, because there's now a lot more options, a lot more different types of leave. Uh, the recognition criteria in GASB 101 is more principles based. Um, it does require a bit more judgment. We get uncomfortable with judgment, but it's necessary uh, when it comes to the complex environment that we operate in now. Um, in order for leave to be recognized as a liability, it must be attributable to services rendered. It must accumulate, meaning it's not a move, uh, use it or lose it policy, and it must be more likely than not uh, to be used or paid out. And I'll, um, just chi I'll just ch chime in here as well that the kind of the crux of this like principle based principles based approach is kind of looking at this paragraph. I think it's paragraph nine and one hundred one, and just determining for the leave if it's if it's not in one of these other buckets that we you know that that we'll talk about here in a minute does it meet these three criteria and, and really that third one that more likely than not like scott pointed out is the one where um involves that judgment and it's probably the one if you've attended a one gasby 101 webinar in the past that has kind of given you the most uh unease uh and uncertainty so so um we'll, we'll discuss that in a little more detail but just want to point out that this is a very important piece of that principles-based approach. And, and you can probably see by this criteria that uh, the employment policies do play a role in in, in this, um, such as how much you're allowed to accumulate. Um, you've got the move it, use it or lose it policy, but you could also have the, can only accumulate 40 hours. And that of course would inform what your liability would end up being. Um, there are a few exceptions on here. So there, there are some rules-based uh, provisions in our mix. And, and I honestly think that if you were to take these situations and apply the principles, you may come up with the right answer. But um, I, I think because some of these exceptions that are noted here would not result in anything material and the effort of coming up with a liability, um, as they say, the juice is not worth the squeeze. And so this was... Uh, uh, this is this is a bone that we that the Gatsby threw us to to make it easier. Leave that is settled. Um, I'm sorry, I'm I'm skipping to the second bullet. Leave that is dependent upon a sporadic event um, that affects a relatively small proportion of employees. Um, the liability should not be recognized until that leave commences. And specifically, it mentions parental leave, military leave, uh, jury duty. Um, and, and we came up with a bunch of other types of leave that probably fall within this category. Again, sporadic event, relatively small proportion of employees. It, it's hard to predict those sporadic events. Um, and, 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 and if you were able to, it would not be very significant. And therefore, let's make that exception. Um, the other exception, um, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, I skipped over it, but leave that is settled through the conversion of a defined benefit, post-employment benefit plan. Uh, that also would not be included in your liability because that's thought to already be included in uh, your, your pension uh, liability or your OPEP liability. Uh, other exceptions um, to the rule, unlimited leave. Um, it's hard to quantify or attribute it to a specific service period um, because it's unpredictable. Um, and so, uh, it, and it would probably be immaterial as well. So, um, um, therefore, there is an exception for that unlimited leave as well as holiday leave. Holiday leave is basically one day at a time, minimal benefit. And so, those are some exceptions that is carved out in GASB 101 that helps um, implement this guidance. The more likely than not has caused some heartburn. I keep hearing um, hearing that. Um, how are we supposed to um, estimate this? Um, but I, for those folks, I, I would remind you that GASB 16 also had a, a threshold. Um, the threshold used was probable. Um, more likely than not is actually a, a better threshold, or at least the GASB decided it was a better threshold. But how do you decide if it's more likely than not to be used? Um, this is where you would consider employment policies, um, the um, uh, use it or lose it policy, um, the historical data, how often do people use it? Um, when do they use it? When does it get paid out? Um, all of those trends um, you would consider in coming up with this more likely than not. Um, and with this threshold, I thought it useful to, to talk about the other thresholds that the GASB considers in other guidance. If you want to move to the next slide, Danny. Um, these are some of the other thresholds that we see in the guidance. Um, remote, reasonably possible, probable, reasonably certain. I put these in dotted lines because the they're they're a little bit hard to define. Um, if you look back in GASB 10, remote is defined as slight. 
you know, reasonably possible is defined as more than remote, uh, probable is defined as likely. Um, in some studies, practitioners um, determine probable to be as high as 90%. Um, and anytime you're talking about the recognition of a liability and uh, you use the probable, there's a concern that you're going to underreport that liability. And so the board settled on more likely than not, um, which means more than 50%. So there's still judgment. There's still an estimate that has to be made, but at least it eliminates the judgment as to what the threshold means, um, because more likely than not is much more clear. I, I can't remember who, who said it, but uh, some one person said that more likely than not is 50% in a feather. So just that that smidge above uh, fifty percent. The other thing I want to point out here um, is that these pers there's not prescriptive percentages anywhere within the guidance. That's why I'm not sure if Scott mentioned it, it had the the dots uh, there. This is just to give you a visualization of where you land relative to the other uh, probability determinations. But we're not saying that there is a certain attached percentage uh, to any of these. Um, once we've determined the type of leave or the, the leave amounts that um, that that's going to be uh, recorded as a liability, um, GASB 101 provides uh, measurement criteria. Um, so using the rates that are in effect as of the balance sheet date when calculating a liability, even if you know about a pay raise the next year, um, you're going to use the pay rates as of the end of the year. The exception being if you happen to know that the payout will be at a different rate than their pay rate, than your employee's pay rate, um, then you would calculate the liability using that, that rate. Um, the other thing um, to um, think about is, is you don't estimate future pay rather meant for when stated adjustments to payment amount. So 50%. Um, are referenced in the arrangement. So, and then, and then we're going to include salary-related payments um, that are directly associated and incrementally associated to um, to the payroll. Um, so, note that the portion of leave that you expect to to pay out at termination um, or that converts to other uh, benefits might not have the same direct and incremental salary payment uh, related payment. So, you'll have to think about that as you're uh, measuring your liability. Um, last, um, just to cover some of the disclosure uh, requirements of GASB 101, uh, the good news is there are no new disclosure requirements. Um, it actually lightens some of the requirements that are previously in, that were previously in place, such as with long-term liabilities. You now have the ability to net the activity on on the long-term liability roll forward um, with you know an indication of that it's netted, um, and then you also are no longer required to disclose the. Um, the government fund that is typically used to liquidate the compensated options. So, so removing some requirements rather than adding new ones. All right, let's go ahead and uh, practice uh, some scenarios with uh, GASB 101. And thank you all for submitting your questions. Uh, we will try to get to those during the polling questions. If not, we'll make sure to respond to you all uh, after the webinar. First one, Benefit County. All right, so Benefit County pays out all vacation leave upon termination. The accounts payable specialist has 50 hours of vacation leave accrued as of their year end, September 30, 2027. And then you can see some salary information there. So at October 1, 26, the salary was 20 an hour, went up to 25 an hour, October 1, 2027, and got a really big raise, must have done great because went up to $39 an hour, October uh, 2028. So what would be the compensated absence liability for this employee's vacation leave? So a couple of things we want to look at here. And we're looking at those, the criteria in terms of does it accumulate? It looks like it because it's saying that it accrued, right? So it's not a use it or lose it. And how and they had 50 hours um, of vacation leave. And it is able to be paid out or, or otherwise used because if we say that they pay out all vacation leave. So under uh, this limited information that we have, we're going to take the 50 hours, and then what are we going to multiply it by? We're going to look at what the pay rate was at September 30, 2027. So in this case, it would be $20 an hour. You get $1,000 of a compensated absence liability. You may ask, well, why didn't I do 25? Because they're getting that the next day. Uh, going back to the guidance that, that Scott provided, you're going to take the pay rate at that balance sheet date in order to calculate uh, the liability. Part two, that same account 
this payable specialist is also eligible for parental leave in uh, the amount of 200 hours. He is recently married and they plan on to have children in the next year or two. What is the compensated absence liability for parental leave as of September 30, uh, 2027? Going back to the, the different types of buckets, parental leave is one of those that is a sporadic event. And so what do they, the guidance say about sporadic events? You don't recognize it until the leave commences. And so you wouldn't have a, a compensated absence liability if the, unless the leave had commenced at September 30, uh, 2027. Great news for all of you that do not want to commit an HR violation by going around and just guessing when your newly married um, employees are going to be having children. And you also don't want to be going up to them and be like, hey, for my compensated absence liability, I really need to know, are you going to have a kid in the next year? Because uh, I might need to book that as a liability. So you just leave that alone, sporadic event. Uh, someone in the comments asked, because uh, we mentioned paternal leave, but, uh, paternity, maternity, they all falls under this bucket of uh, parental leave. Last one, uh, illness, international airport. So IIA pays out 25% of sick leave upon termination up to 240 hours. A few of you all in the comments mentioned, well, our policy only has X, Y, and Z. How does that play in? Going back to the criteria of what you're going to consider, absolutely the employment policy and how it accumulates does factor into your calculation. And so you definitely, each government is going to be different based off of their policies. In this case, the controller has 300 hours of sick leave at fiscal year end. What is the fewest number of hours that should be accrued as a compensated absence for this employee? And so the guidance, there are going to be two areas where you're going to have a lot more work or you know, have a bigger thought exercise, at least, related to GASB 101. Sick is going to be one of them because it's, you're not thinking about vesting anymore, right? You're having to do those that three criteria. Uh, and then um, unrestricted sabbatical is another one that might uh, cause you to think a little bit differently. And so with this, what is the fewest number of hours? So work, so go with me here. At least 25% of 240 is going to be paid out and accumulates. So, so based off of that, we're going to start at a base of at least 60 hours. Now, where you land between the 60 hours and that 300 that he has accrued or he or she has accrued, that's where you go into those other factors that you need to consider. So you're going to be looking at that employment policy. Is all of that 300 eligible for future use? Or are they going to be cutting that down to a certain number uh, every year? Is it kind of a use it or lose it? Um, what is the historical use? So how much of this sick leave has been used uh, previously by year? And, and is that historical use reasonable when applying it to the future? Uh, we've seen some people take uh, you know, average tenure per employee times average sick leave per year, come up with a calculation that way. And what I will tell you all is you don't need to get an actuary involved in this. You know, you let's make some reasonable calculations. Work with a firm such as ourselves will help you all build that out and, and kind of think about it. All right. We want to make sure we get you all out here to the top of the hour. So next polling question number four. What do you perceive will be the hardest part of implementing GASB 101 for your government? Is it identifying all of the compensated absences? And we're about to share with you a bucket checklist for that. Categorizing them based off of the different types of accounting treatments. So which one do I need to go through those three criteria? Which one are just sporadic events? Which one are unpaid? C, the more likely than not evaluation. So making that subjective determination where you don't have something as rules-based for your sick leave. Or D, after... P3s, leases, and speedos. This is a piece of cake. I just needed this, you know, 53 minutes with Danny and Scott, and I'm good to go. And and while and while we wait for that, there's someone had a question about can you clarify one more time the difference between 101 and the previous guidance? And really the previous guidance it was out, it came out in 1992, not as many types of leave. So they were very rules-based. And the, the rules, especially around sick leave. Uh, related more to vesting, and now you know that's that's being done away, and there's a more principles-based approach. So you're going to need to look at your leaves and categorize them differently, and determine if the liability is different. And so let's see the answer. There looks like 33% for categorizing, 30% for more likely than not. 25% of you all feel good to go. That is great to hear. So as we conclude, 
want to touch on this Gatsby 101 buckets checklist. So we we promised you all a takeaway to assist um, with implementation. And so those of you all that are Gatsby as a service clients for Gatsby 96 know that we build quite a variety of templates. So we built something to help identify all of your speedas and search your GL and scan through that. Built an implementation memo, built the a checklist with the 30 different types of uh, subscription-based IT arrangements. And so every for every new piece of guidance that comes out, we want to make sure that you have the tools and templates as you attend these webinars and you take that hour, hour out of your day uh, to work on implementation. And so what we have developed, and we will send put out a polling question here in a second, we've developed is this Gatsby Statement 101 Buckets Checklist. So we pulled together, I believe we ended up with 27 of the most common types of leave that governments have. And we then listed out a description of that leave. And then based off of that description, how you would need to think about the compensated absence liability recognition. Do you need to go through those three criteria? criteria? Is it only recognized when used? Is it recognized when it commences? Or is it unpaid and you don't really even need to worry about it? And so we're gonna go ahead and pop up the last polling question now, which will ask you all if you would like a copy and we'll make sure to get it out to you all um, after the webinar. Uh, won't hurt our feelings if you feel good about it for those of you, the 25% that feel good, but we do want to um, give you all an opportunity to request that checklist. Oh, another thing, our Gatsby as a service client. So for those of you all that do have that, that ongoing support, your client service team will be sending that out um, to you all uh, after this webinar if they haven't already. And if you are in a test client, let your audit partner know and we can make sure that we can get uh, that to you over as well. Perfect. With that, let's go ahead and, and take a look to see if there are uh, any questions. Um, if you want more insight, from us as we kind of look through these questions, Scott. Um, you can see on the right, you can get, get all of our thought leadership library. Uh, on the left, you can uh, ident see our government podcast series. We did about a 15 minute podcast on both 100 and 101 separately. Um, we have a, an article that uh, some of our, a couple of our audit senior managers help us write related to 100 and 101 and what's changing. So that is another uh, resource for you all. Anyone that you want to answer, Scott? Um, just going through the list. So, so, so Sharon asks, why did Gatsby decide to go with the approach for inconsistent information in RSI SI instead of restating for comparability? Seems the latter would be more meaningful to users and readers. Uh, the reason why is because of the effort that might be required to go back and find what you need in order to restate. Um, they didn't want to put undue burden on stakeholders. And so uh, just going, just restating what's in your basic financial statements is enough. And then again, asterisking um, and explaining why it wouldn't be comparable, which isn't unusual. We see it all the time, actually, um, in, in these RSIs, in these stat tables. And, and Catherine asked about the retroactive restatement, if, if only if it is material. Um, every one of these Gatsby standards has that materiality box uh, at the end. And so Gatsby 100 and 101 will also have that box that says this this statement need not apply to uh, immaterial items. As we close, this is what our national uh, accounting advisory group does. I mentioned a few times GASB as a service. Uh, this is what it is. You need help closing your books. You need help with implementing new accounting standards. Um, you know, you just can't find the quite quite find the government expertise. You know, you've, you've had that open rec for a while. You can't quite find it out. We co-source um, and outsource different pieces of your accounting and uh, financial close, ACRA reporting, all those types of things. You can find our email addresses uh, here. Uh, we're also very active on LinkedIn. Look up Danny Martinez CPA, Scott Anderson CPA. Uh, you should be able to find us. Please connect with us because because we share a lot of this content um, there. We let you all know about upcoming events. Uh, someone asked when the next webinar is. We do one of these about every quarter. And then the firm has our big government uh, and public sector seminar around the, the July, August timeframe. We are also available. If you all have a um, an event, you know, like the, the state GFOA or an AGA association or any of those types of conferences uh, over the next, you know, three, six months, and you're interested in having Scott or I attend, 
just shoot us an email. We, we're more than happy to get out there and to help continue to provide informative and hopefully, as we said at the beginning, slightly entertaining GASB content. So with that, we are right at the hour mark. Thank you again so much for spending part of your day with us. And we really hope uh, to connect with you again very soon. Thank you so much.